So today we're going to continue on with something called absolute value functions. This is going to build off of what we did yesterday. As a matter of fact, we're going to start with a little bit of review as to what yesterday was covering. Um, but then we're going to look just more in general as to how absolute value behaves when it is in a function form. Let's get going. Uh, so again, today's plan, review solving absolute value equations from last class. Then we're going to introduce absolute value functions as well as graphing absolute value functions. So yes, we will have to draw some graphs today. Uh, you will need to be prepared for that. Uh, you'll also, uh, at very least, briefly need your uh, graphing calculator today. There's something I'm going to show you early on that'll help you with the stuff we've learned yesterday, uh, where you know a, a graphing calculator can come into to play. Uh, and one other thing that you'll want to have today, or at least really be ideal to have, would be at least two different color pencils or pens. Now, pencils would be pre preferable, like even if one is just a normal color pencil, like a regular plain pencil, uh, and then the other one was maybe a colored pen of some sort. Uh, you'll just need two different color things here today. Uh, you won't need it, but it'll help for one part. Anyway, let's move. So an absolute value equation. This is what we were covering last class. This is, of course, just where you have an absolute value built into something and it's equal to another side. Uh, hopefully what you remember, I'll walk you through this one. If you want to pause the video here and give it a try on your own, by all means, go for it. But I am walking through it. Uh, what you want to do is you want to get that absolute value piece all by itself. So this thing right here should be all by itself, the very first step, right? So you'll notice there's a four multiplying outside of it. Good step would be divide both sides by four. And if we're dividing both sides by four, that means we have to divide this entire side by four, not just like the end of it or anything, you have to divide the whole thing. So this is gonna leave us with the absolute value of three X minus four equals this whole thing divided by four is gonna be two X plus two because each of these things need to be divided by four. Now that we have the absolute value piece all by itself, this is where we just say the stuff inside the absolute value, so 3x minus 4, equals that right-hand side, 2x plus 2, or that stuff inside the absolute value bar, so 3x minus 4, uh, could equal the negative version of all that, so negative in brackets, 2x plus 2. I'm going to solve this positive side first. We want to get all our x's to one side, so I'll move 2x over, and while I'm at it, I'll add 4. This is going to give me x equals 6, and I'll just hold that there for now. I won't box it or anything quite yet. Uh, on this other side, though, the negative, uh, the negative possibility, we've got a little bit more work to do. It's 3x minus 4 equals negative 2x minus 2. That's what would happen if you double dip the negative through. Uh, and then again, gather everything to one side. So I'll move the x's to this side, and I'll move the numbers to the right side. This gives me 5x equals 2. Uh, or therefore x is equal to 2 over 5, or if you prefer decimal, I guess that'd be 0 0.4. Uh, now again, notice I haven't boxed either of these, and that's because we haven't actually confirmed if these are correct answers, uh, so we should probably check both of these. So I'm going to do a check down here. If we're going to check 6 first, we have to throw it back into the original thing, so 4 times the absolute value of 3 times 6 minus 4, and we want to see if that equals 8 times 6 plus eight. So again, I just reused this original equation up here, just replacing x with six. Uh, if I start solving, this is going to be four times the absolute value of, I guess that's 14, equals eight times six. Why is that escaping me? Eight times six, I believe is 48. 48 plus, or 40, yeah, 48. Yeah, 48 plus eight is uh, 56. That took me longer than it should have. Anyway, moving on. Uh, four times the absolute value of 14 is just four times 14, and that actually does equal 56. So we see 56 equals 56. Boom, that did work. So we can put a box around that answer now saying that it did in fact work. Uh, as for this one, two over five, we gotta do the exact same thing to it. Uh, we should have enough room just below here. Uh, so for my check, we're gonna check that four times the absolute value of three times two fifths uh, minus four uh, equals eight times two fifths, sorry, I'm just keeping checking up about that old formula up there, uh, plus eight. All right, let's see where this goes. Uh, three times two fifths is uh, six fifths. So I guess we have to say four times six fifths. Uh, and then minus four here doesn't really do much. We should turn this into something over five so we can actually do an operation with that. Uh, four to put it over five, you just multiply the top and the bottom by five. So it's 20 over five. That's the same thing as saying four. Uh, this equals 8 times 2 over 5 is 16 over 5, plus 8, well, maybe we should turn that into something over 5 as well, so multiply it by 5 over 5, and you have 40 over 5. This becomes 4 times the absolute value of 6 over 5 minus 20 over 5 is negative 14 over 5, 
equals 16 over 5 plus 40 over 5 is 56 over 5. Now, the absolute value of negative 14 over 5 is just positive 14 over 5. And if you multiply that by 4, you're going to see you'll have 56 over 5 equals 56 over 5. So, yeah, that one worked too. So x equals 2 over 5 is another one of our possible answers. These are annoying because they're a lot of work, right? And you do have to check everything. I know that's kind of a pain. Um, but as long as you do a little bit of work on that one and show me just that you've done some form of check, uh, you'll be totally good to go. That's all I'm really looking for. All right, so for advanced questions though, uh, like that was annoying enough as is, for advanced questions, you can actually use your graphing calculator to solve. So if I didn't say you had to algebraically show your work or anything, you could just use your graphing calculator and solve this. Uh, what I want you to note though, is that you can put an absolute value function in your calculator by pressing the math button and then going right arrow to number. Uh, and then number one says ABS. So that's absolute value. Uh, so if you put that in, uh, it'll take the absolute value of whatever's in the brackets that you set as parameters for it. And you can actually put this into your Y, uh, y equals section uh, to actually graph an absolute value. Now, if you were to solve uh, an absolute value equation, like that last question using your graphing calculator, you just have to graph both sides of the equation in your calculator. So put one of them in Y1 and put the other side in Y2. And then you just find the point or points of intersection of the two graphs uh, to find your solution of your equation. So here's an example of it. Uh, find the solution or solutions to the nearest hundredth. Uh, so we've got something pretty advanced going on here. There's two absolute value pieces going on here. That's kind of crazy because usually we say you got to get the absolute value piece all by itself, but there's two of them in here. Uh, so algebraically solving this one's not really uh, in the cards, right? We kind of have to solve this another way. Uh, so what I'd advise is, and I want you guys to actually try this so you can uh, gain some practice at this. I want you to take this whole side here and plug it into Y1. And then the 33, I want you to put it into Y2. So again, you'll need to use the absolute value feature in your calculator by pressing math and then going right arrow and then saying ABS. Uh, you'll put this in, in ABS. So in your Y1, it'll look like Y1 equals ABS X minus five, close the bracket off and then plus ABS six X plus two, close the bracket off. And then of course, Y2 equals 33. So pause the video here, punch this in the calculator, see if you're able to get that. And again, we're looking for the points of intersection. Um, anyway, give it a shot. Okay, so hopefully you were able to get this. Uh, personally, I actually had to change my window because uh, there wasn't an intersection within the standard window. So from the standard window, I actually just changed my Y max to equal 50. You could have gone something a little less than that or a little more. Uh, it's not the end of the world. I just changed it to 50 just to see where I was going. And then that gave you a window where I was allowed to, to see what was going on. Uh, to find the intersect, you have to press second, then trace, and then go down to intersect. Uh, and then you just basically have to use your arrow keys to line things up. So the two answers I get, long story short, x equals negative 5.71. And the other one is x equals positive 3.71. Uh, if you're having trouble with that, or if you're not really sure how to in, uh, do the intersect, uh, just jump back into the Zoom and just say, hey, like, Scott, can you like show me that? And maybe I could even like turn my camera on and show you what I'm doing in my calculator uh, to actually get that to work. Uh, one other thing I want to say is when you solve using a graphing calculator, you don't actually have to check your answers uh, because really they wouldn't have shown up in your graphing calculator for these kinds of questions if they didn't actually work. Uh, so don't worry about checking your answer here. Uh, they should be totally good to go. Okay, so next up, absolute value functions. This is the real meat and potatoes of today. So I want you to recall, a function is just a machine where you can plug in an X and it spits out a Y. So we always said that Y is equal to F of X, where F is a function and it's doing something to X, right? So a function is like a machine changing X. What we're gonna deal with today are absolute value functions. So it's basically where you have a function where your final result is being taken with an absolute value and that's gonna be equal to your Y. Uh, so I want you to note that with an absolute value function, no matter what X you plug in, your Y value is always going to be positive because ultimately the, the output of that function is being taken with absolute value. And therefore that, of course, by definition of absolute value will make it positive. Anyway, let's see what this uh, implications of this is. So here's the graph on this graph right here. It's in your notes as well. This is a graph of 2X plus 4. It's just a linear equation, right? Our slope is two, we're going up by two every time we go over one, and our y-intercept is four, right? Linear equations, that was from math nine. I want you to make a table and draw the graph of y equals the absolute value of two x plus four. 
um, it's going to look very similar to this, right? Uh, making a table kind of helps us illustrate what's really going on. Um, but it's, it's often hard to tell where we're even going to start with our table. So let me just kind of guide you through with this, right? And I'll explain why in just a moment. Let's make a table, X and Y. Sorry, my phone's just ringing here. I'm just going to cancel that call, whoever it's from. Um, anyway, we're going to make a table, X and Y. Um, and with X and Y in our table, we should start somewhere to the left of our X intercept, right? I'll explain why that is in just a second again, but I'm going to start maybe somewhere down here. Like, let's say, how about we plug in X equals negative five first. Uh, and then we're just going to make our table going up from there. So negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero. Uh, and then we'll say one. Might as well just finish it off there. If X was negative five and we were plugging it into this function right here, we'd have two times negative five, which is negative 10 plus four, which is negative six, and then the absolute value of that, which is positive six. Hmm. Okay, well, let's see this next one. X is negative four. If you plug negative four into here, two times negative four is negative eight. Negative eight plus four is negative four. Absolute value of negative four is positive four. Next one, negative three. Two times negative three is negative six. Negative six plus four is negative two. Absolute value of negative two is positive two. Now, something interesting will happen here. X is negative two. Uh, if you plug negative two in here, you get two times negative two is negative four. Negative four plus four is zero. Absolute value of zero is just zero. And then nothing interesting happens after this. Wait and see. If X is negative one, two times negative one is negative two. Negative two plus four is positive two. Absolute value of positive two is positive two. At zero, two times zero is zero. Zero plus four is four. Absolute value of four is four. Then the last one, two times one is two. Two plus four is six. Absolute value of six is six. Now, the reason I say nothing interesting happens here is because if you look at your original graph of f, this being your original f, we'll say, um, at x is equal to negative 2, we're already at y is equal to 0. At x is equal to negative 1, we're already at y is equal to 2. At x is equal to 0, we're already at y is equal to 4. And when uh, x is equal to 1, we're already at y is equal to 6. So it's like nothing is changing in this section. So I'll even say no, no change. Nothing's changed here. But this section, on the other hand, this is where things actually get a little bit more interesting. When x is negative 3, that's right here, usually on the original graph, it was negative 2. But notice on this new graph, it's going to be up here at positive 2. So that is different from this down here. When x is negative 4, Originally, we were at negative 4 for y, but now it's actually positive 4, so we're up here instead. The other one we looked at was x is negative 5. Well, when x is negative 5, usually we're way down here at ne uh, negative 6, but instead we're up here now at positive 6. So the shape of our graph is going to be a bit of a weird one. If we're going to graph this, I'll do it as best I can using this pen tablet thing I've got here. This section is going to be the same, but then this section is going off this way. That's about as good as I can get with this. It's harder than harder than it looks using this computer tablet thing. Uh, anyway, that's the shape of our absolute value graph. So it's like our absolute value graph becomes this really sharp V-shaped point. What I want you to notice is your x-intercept right here is your pivot point. In other words, that's the point at which things change from being the same to being flipped. All we did was we took this negative portion of the graph and we had to flip it up to become a positive portion of the graph, which if you think about what an absolute value function does, that really shouldn't be a big surprise because again, an absolute value just turns something from negative to positive, or if it was already positive, it just leaves it as positive. So the main takeaway I want you to get from this is that when you take the absolute value of a full function, it just takes any of the negative portions, negative being you know underneath your x-axis, it just takes any of those negative portions and flips it to become a positive portion. It's just a mirror image uh, above that x-axis. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, piecewise functions. I mentioned yesterday in the video there was a, like a fancy definition of absolute value. Um, this, this is where it actually gets used. And, and just believe me, people always hate these. So if you, if you look at this and you're like, what on earth are you talking about, Scott? Um, you're, you're not alone. Every single year I have people that just complain about this. Uh, but a piecewise function is just basically breaking down your function with absolute value without actually using the absolute value sign. 
so for this original function that we had from before, we can actually express the absolute value of this using a piecewise function. Always start by finding your x-intercept. We can do that quite easily by looking at this. The x-intercept is uh, x is equal to negative two. In this case, x equals negative two. Remember, by definition, an x-intercept is where y is equal to zero. You have always solved this and you would have found that, yeah, x, x is equal to negative two. Anyway, so that's going to be the basis of your piecewise function. Here's how the piecewise function is going to work. Say y equals, and then do these really weird squiggly bracket kind of things, right? We want to look first at where our function is going to remain the same. Notice from before, this whole section right here is staying the same. So in other words, since that part's staying the same, it's literally just going to be 2x plus 4 when, or you could say if, I don't really care, it doesn't matter, when or if, doesn't matter, when x is, notice it's greater than or equal to negative 2. So we can even just say greater than or equal to negative 2. So that part is the same. y is going to equal just this thing here when x is greater than or equal to negative 2. The rest of it, though, when x is less than negative 2, it's got to flip above that, uh, that x-axis. Now, to do this, it's just like we have to multiply all of these coordinates by negative 1, because multiplying by negative 1 flips it over to become a positive version of the same thing. So you might as well just say it's negative, that's like a negative 1, times your original function, so negative 2x plus 4. Uh, and that's when x is less than negative 2. If you prefer, you could even double dip this negative through. I'm not going to be that picky. I think it's way easier to do it this way. So the bottom line is, when you're asked to make a piecewise function for an absolute value uh, function here, just find your x-intercept. That's going to be the basis of where things are flipping. Then identify your portion or portions, because sometimes you can have more than one. You'll see that a little later, uh, where the function stays the same. And then find the portion or portions where it doesn't stay the same and just write it as negative the original function and then identify the, the gaps in which it's changed. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Don't worry about it too much if it didn't, um, or at least ask me in the Zoom, you know, what, hey, can you explain piecewise functions again? But every single year, people just really don't like these. Anyway, moving on. All right, here we go. Here's where fun really, really comes into play. Uh, sometimes the absolute value functions that we're gonna graph are not gonna be nice, straightforward uh, linear, linear equations. Sometimes they're actually going to be quadratic functions. Uh, so what I want you to recall is if you have a quadratic in the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, we call this standard form, uh, then you can find the x-intercept, or sorry, the x-coordinate of your vertex by using the formula x equals negative b over 2a. Once you have that vertex, you could graph it using the 1, 4, 9 rule. So in other words, you started by plotting your vertex, and then you use the 1, 4, 9 rule where you said, oh, I'm going to go over 1 and then up 1 times a. And then you'll start back here and you'll go over two and then you go up four times a and then you'll start back here and go over three and then go up nine times a and then sometimes you can even make it one four nine sixteen rule and go over four points and then up 16 times a uh, this works the same with absolute value functions uh, you just need to make sure that any part that lies below the x-axis needs to be reflected above the x-axis also the x-intercepts are super important because those are going to be your pivot points so if you can find those x-intercepts, which of course are just the solution to this is equal to zero, um, that really helps guide things as well. So I've included this in your, in your printed notebook, and it might not be super clear because uh, it was of course printed in black and white, um, but this picture, and I love how it says to the left, it should be to the right. Don't know what on earth's going on there. The picture to the right shows the graph of y equals the absolute value uh, of x squared minus four x, right? So this red portion right here is the absolute value of x squared minus 4x. Now the dashed line, so this blue part right here, as well as you might even see the dashes kind of flow through the whole thing, uh, that actually shows the original function x squared minus 4x. No absolute value, just the original thing. And that's a more traditional quadratic, it's a U-shaped function, that's the same. I just want you to note that the absolute value function, so when we took the absolute value of the whole thing, all it did was it took this negative piece down here and flipped it like a total mirrored version of it just so it was above the x-axis. That's all absolute value functions do. They just flip the negative piece so it becomes positive. Everything that was already positive stays positive. It's all the same, okay? Hopefully that makes some sense. So here's an example. Suppose we wish to graph this guy right here, the absolute value of negative x squared plus two x uh, plus eight. 
I've broken this down so it kind of like helps you guide how to actually solve these questions. Keep in mind on a test, we wouldn't necessarily break it down like this for you. You'd have to just know, um, but just because we're still learning this, let's break it down to some steps. First step, step A, start by finding the vertex of the quadratic. Don't worry about the absolute value signs yet. So in other words, find the vertex of the quadratic as if there was no absolute value there at all. Just ignore it, just find that vertex. Well, remember, vertex is x equals negative b over 2a. That'll tell you the x coordinate of your vertex. Uh, so in this case, it's going to be x equals negative 2 over 2 times negative 1. Well, negative 2 divided by 2 times negative 1 is negative 2 over negative 2, which is just positive 1. So our x part of our vertex is positive 1. Um, but we need the y part of our vertex as well. So again, ignore your absolute value pieces here. We'll just find the vertex of the original quadratic. Believe me, that'll be easier in the long run. Just take one, x is one, and plug it into the original thing here. So negative one squared plus two times one plus eight. That I believe is going to equal uh, negative one because it's one squared is one, negative one plus two is, uh, I guess that's one, and then one plus eight, that's nine. So our vertex of our original quadratic is the coordinate one, nine. That'll be useful. So box it. We'll come back to that in a second. Part two, so step B, find the x-intercepts. Recall that you can use factoring or you could use the quadratic formula to do this. Uh, I'm going to go nuts here. I'm actually going to use factoring on this one, but I want you to be careful. You might look at this and be tempted to just say, oh, it's, you know, it's just going to be a sum product rule question. Well, since there's a negative in front of the x squared, technically this makes it an adapted sum product rule question, right? So that's where we have to look at this as being our sum, but this number times the, the last number is gonna be our product. So we're looking for two numbers with a sum of positive two, but a product, product of negative one times eight, so a product of negative eight. Uh, well, the two numbers that are gonna do that are positive four and negative two. So then we use those two numbers to split apart that middle term. So we've got negative x squared, and remember I said positive four and negative two, so plus four x minus two x uh, and then plus eight. And then of course, because we're using the adapted sum product rule, we have to use brackets around the first two and brackets around the second two. So put brackets here and then put brackets here. But then I want you to notice there was a negative here and that always plays uh, you know, a funny trick on us. When there's a negative in here, that means we have to change the sign of this guy in here. So it becomes two x minus eight. Uh, next up, we have to factor out whatever we can. Uh, I'm going to be a little, you know, different on this one, uh, cause usually we like just having an X, like a single X, as far as we can get here. So what I'm going to factor out of these two right now is I'm going to take out a negative X from both of these. Uh, so that will pull out a negative X here and that'll leave us with just X. And then instead of plus four X, it'll be minus four. Because again, if this negative X were to multiply back through, you'd have plus four X. Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, minus, what I can take out of these two though is just a positive two. So it'd be two times X minus four. And what do you notice? We got X minus four, X minus four. So this tells us we have X minus four times negative X minus two. That's gonna be our, uh, our quadratic in factored form. And if you set that equal to zero, that's gonna help you find your X uh, intercepts, right? Because again, X intercepts are just where Y is equal to zero. So analyzing this, for this piece, that's going to mean x is going to equal 4. There's one of your x-intercepts. And for this piece, if we were to add 2, that's uh, negative x equals positive 2, and then divide by negative 1, you'll see that x is equal to negative 2 is your other x-intercept. So these guys right here, those are going to be our x-intercepts. Uh, so in other words, where we're crossing our x-axis. And usually we wouldn't care to find that. And as a matter of fact, if you were just to graph this, I'm sure you'd be able to find those x-intercepts, no problem but it's just nice having them set in stone because this will help guide our graph. You're gonna see that in the next step right here. Uh, so step C, lightly sketch in pencil the graph of the quadratic using your 149 rule. Um, I'm gonna flip forward to my next slide, or at least maybe it's even a slide after. Oh yeah, my next slide. Uh, but I want you to do step C right now as well. I'll just do it on this page because my graph's here and this will, this will hold it in. Um, so we wanna sketch our graph in pencil uh, using the 149 rule. Now, the word lightly, I'll go back to it, the word lightly is really important because remember, any negative portions of our graph are going to need to be erased. So don't like go super hard with this or anything. Just, just lightly do it in pencil. Uh, so to graph this, of course, uh, start with your vertex. So your vertex was at the point 1, 9. That's this point right up here. 
Uh, and then just to help guide ourselves, remember we found our x-intercepts were negative two and positive four. So I'll put those in here as well, negative two, positive four. You're already seeing kind of a general outline of the graph. Uh, and then use your one, four, nine rule to do the rest, right? So start at your vertex, go over one, and then up one times a. Well, one times a in this case is one times negative one. So we have to go up negative one. That means we're gonna go down one, right? And just make it symmetrical on both sides. Then the next step, go over two from your vertex and then up four times a. So four times uh, negative one is negative four. So one, two, three, four. There's our next point and we'll make it symmetrical on this side. Uh, and then really just to send it home here, you're gonna, you're gonna see what this is. Go back to your vertex, go over three points and then up nine times a, because that's part of one, four, nine. Nine times negative one is negative nine. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What do you know? We already have it, it was our vertex. Uh, if you want to go one step further, remember I said it's a 1, 4, 9, and then 16, because that's the next perfect square on here. Let's do it just for fun. Go back to your vertex, go over four points, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then down 16. Well, we know that's 9, so we'll keep following it from there. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 right here, and then that means 16 is right here as well. So very lightly in pencil, I want you to go over the general shape of this graph, uh, to, to get it put in. Now, of course, because I'm doing this on a computer, I can't like lightly shade anything here. So I'm just going to do it in two different colors. Here's the original, right? Do this portion here first. Yep. And then go a little further down. Ooh, that was bad. Do the best I can on this one. It's not easy using this pen tablet thing. That was okay. And that was okay. And then just keep it going down with your arrow and that with your arrow. Uh, so again, this section in particular down here is going to be very lightly shaded in pencil because, of course, we need to flip it above uh, our x-axis. Anyway, that's our lightly lightly drawn original graph using the 149 rule. Go back to step D. Flip any segment of the graph that lies below the x-axis so that it's mirrored above the x-axis uh, and then erase the old segment below. So exactly what it said there, this stuff that's below the x-axis, oops, this stuff below the x-axis has to be flipped above. That was why it's so nice to have this point here. Notice this point is down at negative seven. So really it's got to flip up to positive seven. Same with this one down here. It's also got to flip up to positive seven and then everything else with this has to go with it. So I'm going to change pen color real quick here. I'm going to make it, how about we'll say blue. Uh, so this section down here needs to flip above. So it's going to look something along the lines of this. There we go and there we go, right? And then just to really send it home, we'll recolor this stuff right here because that stuff's going nowhere. It's part of the absolute value graph as well because it was already above the Y axis. Uh, always a good idea to erase the stuff below too. Let's see if this actually works. Oh, it does, there we go, good. So erase that, bingo, bango, bongo, we're all good, right? That's our absolute value graph right there. That's this guy, that is this, all graphed and ready to go, perfect. Okay, step E and step F. These ones aren't always necessary, but sometimes I will ask. State your domain and range and express this as a piecewise function. So again, I won't always ask this, but it's just nice to know. Let's start with our domain. Remember, if, uh, if you've forgotten what domain's all about, I know it's been a while. Domain is your possible X values that you could plug in here. So you always should ask yourself, is there any value of X that I just would not be allowed to plug into this? Well, looking at this, it doesn't look like there's going to be, right? There's no like vertical asymptotes or anything like that. So I think I can just say X is an element of the real numbers. Uh, and then as for range, range is your possible Y values. Uh, so I always look for a minimum Y value and a maximum Y value. Well, the minimum Y value I'll have on here is zero uh, and the maximum is infinity. So I can just say Y is greater than or equal to zero. So there you go. Uh, last up here, express this as a piecewise function. This is where things get a little bit weird. What I want you to note is the graph is the same as the original in this portion right here, from negative two to positive four. So I'll say it again. The graph is the same as the original between negative two and positive four. So in your piecewise function, you say y equals, and then this big squiggly bracket thing, Again, it's the same as the original from negative two to positive four. So negative X squared plus two X plus eight. That's your original function. When X is between negative two and positive four. So I always start with my lower number, negative two, 
is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 4. So this reads uh, as uh, y is equal to the same original function when x is between negative 2 and positive 4, right? So x has to be a bigger number than negative 2, but a lesser number than 4, okay? What about these other sections, though? These, these two arms that have been, you know, put up above the x-axis here. Well, technically, that's the negative equivalent of the entire original fraction. So negative, negative x squared plus 2x plus 8. That flips it, right? That's that negative out there is just taking all of these coordinates down here, multiplying by negative 1, which makes them positive because they were already negative. Now, I want you to notice that this is in two different pieces. This is when x is less than negative 2 or when x is greater than positive 4. So we can say when, just like we just said, x is less than negative 2. So x is less than negative 2 or when x is greater than positive 4. So x is greater than positive 4. Uh, so again, just have another look through that. If you have any questions on piecewise functions, please make sure you're asking. So for practice, uh, page 375, questions 1, 2, 5, and then 6, A, C, E, 7, and then 8, A, C, E. Uh, you really, really need to do these. Again, like it's time consuming, I know, but really practice is absolutely essential on this. You can't just watch me do it and expect you're going to be a master of this. Uh, in your note package on page 10, right after this, uh, I've included several blank graphs uh, in your note booklet so that you can have a little bit of graphing paper to do some of these questions. So make good use of those. Um, I think I threw, yeah, six of them. Yeah, I threw six of them in there. Whether you use them all or if you use just a couple of them, that's up to you. Uh, but please make sure you're completing these questions. Remember, there is no homework assignment for Chapter 7. We're already like almost halfway through Chapter 7, so it is a quick one. Uh, if you need any help, make sure you're jumping back into the Zoom and asking, um, or at very least sending me a message on Remind or something. Anyway, best of luck, guys. Sorry for the long video today, uh, but I'm here to help.